This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. It's indeed a pleasure to uh, be here and thank uh, Dr. Conte and the organizing committee for inviting me. Uh, I was actually on a high. I was on super unleaded from Shell and, and uh, Chevron yesterday because I spent the morning in the clinic with Alex. And, and uh, I used to study at UC up on that floor, and that's where I met Gene Washington in the elevator, who became the vice chancellor, who was my roommate. And now he's over at Duke. It's amazing how all these things come back together and how we stay, uh, stay connected. Uh, my little overview here is uh, my relationship, a little bit overview on the history. Uh, Dr. Mills uh, gave an outstanding uh, talk on uh, the Wi-Fi and the toe flow uh, aspect of how podiatry and vascular should, uh, should be working uh, together. And I totally agree with that 300%. Uh, I gave a talk at an NIH workshop. The title of it was The Interaction of Vascular uh, with Neuropathy. And I really did not want to give the lecture uh, because I hadn't really performed any research on that, but I did a lot of work on that. So it's really interesting that everything that's actually going on is at the cellular level, and there are about four or five metabolic, about five metabolic pathways of how uh, that happens. But I believe that uh, uh, vascular precedes neuropathy, and there's more compelling information in term, from a translational perspective now uh, that we do, we do know. And I think that the most important part as related to the historical aspects would be the relationships uh, within our system of care. Uh, he mentioned the Wi-Fi system. We did the UT system. And what I realized is that nobody uses it. That's why we get bad outcomes. And every time I give a talk anywhere, I ask my students. I have 300 osteopathic medical students, but I actually take every class in the basic science. My first graduating class, I asked that question, and that was the... Uh, Answer, they've been all around the country to the great hospitals, and they did not know the wound and risk system. And I almost said, I'm not going to sign your diploma because uh, I can't trust you. And so when you look at the knowledge translation from research to efficacy to efficiency, effectiveness, then it's availability and distribution. We know what the best treatment is. It is available, but it's not being distributed. And that's why the clinical piece, Dr. Mills, the educational piece is as big as the clinical piece in that regard. So you have to educate everybody in the health sciences complex if we're going to make a big difference. From PA to nurse practitioner, they got to rotate. And it can't be every now and then. I grew up on a farm. My father said the hardest part about doing good is you got to do it every day, not once a week in the process. So let me go quickly because I don't want to go over. I have no re uh, nothing to disclose. Um, let's see here. I'm mashing the button, it don't want to move. What? Left click? Okay, this is a very, very important slide historically, and from a vascular perspective, we do not have a vascular surgeon on this picture. When I decided I would show this picture, but it's a landmark because all the uh, luminaries in the diabetic foot are here, Wagner, uh, Paul Brand, Marv Levin, they've all deceased, uh, Roger Pecorero. Also, uh, th this was a 1990 picture. The diabetic foot started in 1985. But we did not have a vascular surgeon at our health science center at the time. And I believe I invited one of the private guys who trained under Gene Strandness up in uh, Seattle. His name was David Mazursky, and they had a group called PVA in San Antonio. So I was practicing a couple of days a week, so those were the individuals that I was working with, and so that's how, where my residents started to rotate at the Baptist Hospital, and we developed a great relationship. And it wasn't until 93 that we actually had a uh, board-certified vascular surgeon where we really actually created the uh, vascular surgery service. And that's when Dr. Razorman came, and Dr. Razorman uh, was such a great resident that uh, they wanted to know when he presented, was he the fella or was he the staff? I mean, he was an intern. I couldn't believe it. So he was just, just that good. And uh, that started that relationship uh, quite well because in academics, it's really about knowledge. It's about knowledge and being humble and sharing and, and talking about the 
gaps and controversies and all that so that we can actually continue to grow and get better. So this is kind of a uh, overview that I, I keep mashing the wrong button here. You, I, I gotta go back, I'm sorry. Okay, my relationship. Uh, my grandfather, uh, my father told, my, told me that my grandfather lost his arm when he was 15 um, because of diabetes. And I learned two years ago that he had a BKA on June the 26th, 1939. He died two days later. So I added this to that. Then uh, I was a resident at Atlanta Hospital in 1976, and it was a vascular surgeon named Dr. Weaver from Georgia Baptist. And he would come there to do a film pop bypass with this Gore-Tex. The other residents wanted to do a bunion and a triple orthodesis. I realized that I said, you know what? If I'm going to do surgery and I cut a vessel, I want to be able to repair it. So I'm going to scrub every time he let me scrub with him. And guess what? I wanted to let, him, let me suture. So finally, last five or six, seven cases, I learned to do that. My grandmother had a BKA uh, after she uh, had a puncture wound in the, on the farm. Uh, and my personal relationship was when I had a non-healing elected bunion four days post-op in 1980, and I'll show you that slide in a second. Uh, the um, inaugural foot meeting for San Antonio was uh, 1985, and in 1986, I was like the number one referral, uh, primarily at the Santa Rosa Hospital for diabetic foot through a prominent endocrinologist named Dr. Uh, Richard Becker. And then I worked with the PVA group that I mentioned, and then in 1993, I mentioned that uh, we were devoid of the, of the vascular uh, surgery people. So this is, my, this is my foot. Sorry about that. Uh, this patient had an ulcer about the size of a quarter, maybe about a good centimeter and a half, maybe two. And we treated it, and it reduced to the size of a, less than a dime. And I'd been telling him that he needed to have his bunionectomy, and he did. And he came back four days uh, post-op. And the resident saw this, and I said, what do you think? Uh, I said, it's pre-gangrene. Pre the guy gonna lose his first ray. And I almost crapped in my pants because I didn't, he had a pulse as strong as mine. We did not have a vascular surgery residency, so I sent him to uh, the little lab, and they sent me a report back said that his blood flow was adequate to heal, and he didn't heal. He actually ended up with a TMA. So uh, it says, uh, uh, nothing but the blood, wow. What that means is, if you think about the interactions of vascular neuropathy, all complications from diabetes are related to blood flow. And so that's why the marriage with vascular and podiatry is so paramount in, in leading the team. And it's, it's symbiotic and one cannot do without the other. And Dr. Mills clearly elucidated that in his talk, so I won't belabor that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all screwed me up on the left and the right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, one mark. So, history wise, uh, Elliot Jocelyn uh, from the uh, Jocelyn Clinic uh, actually espoused the role of podiatry, uh, actually, through the, actually in the 20s, uh, and he talked about a team approach. And the first podiatry clinic was established in uh, 1928. And so he really understood the role of podiatry. There was another MD named MJ, MJ Louis out of New York who started the New York College of Podiatric Medicine. And even in the late 1800s, uh, he uh, wrote about the role that podiatric medicine play in keeping uh, Manhattan, New York walking, and America walking. And over time, as uh, it, uh, the diabetes continued to develop, the, uh, va the vascular group developed at the uh, Jocelyn Clinic and uh, New England Deaconess uh, Hospital. And so I think McKittrick was a general surgeon that was uh, performing a significant amount of transmetatarsal amputations, and then it was Wheelock. Uh, I think this was probably in the 60s and 70s uh, in that particular area er, era where they uh, started to do more vascular in, uh, interventions. And then you had LeJeffro and Gary Gibbons and Papa Selly and all the other outstanding vascular surgeons. And I know that Dr. Um, Andros uh, trained uh, not at the Deaconess, but I think he was at the Mass General, if I remember correctly. Uh, following uh, that, Dr. Wagner, who was known for the Wagner ulcer classification from Rancho Los Amigos and Downing, uh, he published a treatise in 1981, Foot and Ankle in the National Journal on the dysvascular dis foot. And his uh, ulcer classification was probably the most widely uh, disseminated classification in terms of utilization over uh, many, many uh, years. Uh, I attended Bolton's meeting in 1989, uh, which was a uh, uh, every two-year meeting. 
in the UK in Malvern. And I heard this guy named John Took talk about functional microvascular disease. And so I started reading a, reading a lot about that at the cellular level. And I had John to come to our meeting on several, uh, several occasions. But he actually published a textbook on functional uh, microvascular disease. And in 1997, the uh, highlight, I think, was the Pecoraro lecture. It was actually a, 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 a discussion uh, between LeGeffro and Took. And the question was, the question I asked Dr. Montero Baker this morning, is functional microvascular disease clinically uh, significant? The role of the uh, of UT uh, in our podiatry program, uh, we basically uh, published the um, University of Texas wound and risk systems. One was in 95, the other one was in 96. One was in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery, and the other one was in the Journal of uh, uh, the American Podiatric Medical Association. And Lavery and Armstrong, uh, Lavery was a resident, 88 to 90, and uh, he uh, moved to Kokomo, Indiana for practice, and he would write me these letters about research, so I told him he should come back and get mentored, get a master's in public health or clinical investigation, and he did that and ran that research group, and Armstrong came along in 95. So when we put those guys together, I was a great teacher, but it's like the San Antonio Spurs. You know, I lived there for 25 years. You gotta get the right people on the right team and know their lanes and work together. So we had a tremendous uh, a team of people that were working. Uh, Dr. Steinberg was there, uh, came also as a fellow, uh, et cetera. And we were one of the busiest services uh, there in the, in the hospital. The American uh, Diabetes Association Foot Care Council started in 1987. And I love to tell the story that I beat Dr. Wagner by one vote as the founding chair. And as I mentioned, everything comes full circle. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. That's what happens when you get 66. Um, but the person that nominated me, I was running the meeting. and. Uh, the person we wanted to get elected was, was asked, and following that was um, a guy named Chambers from Rancho Los Amigos nominated Wagner, and uh, Carl Groinfield. He was at the VA and a big endocrinologist, but it was about 500 people there. He asked me, was I interested in being the chair? And I said, no, uh, that I wasn't uh, officially running, but if I was nominated, I'd be happy to serve. So he nominated me. I had no uh, earthly idea who this guy was. And so that's what happened. And as we, as we talk about integrating and emerging, that's the single biggest thing ever happened to the profession of podiatric medicine because uh, I went from a nobody to a somebody, meaning that I was sitting at the table with all the chairs of the council, which made up this professional advisory panel for the American Diabetes Association. So that was really, really a, uh, a significant. Um, and then in the, in the late 80s, I mean the late early 90s and late 90s, uh, there was a significant uh, a burst of research in wound healing. And so Otto McNeil J&J &J came out with a new uh, platelet-derived growth factor called uh, Regranix. And then I served on the FDA panel at that particular time, which was the first time I'd served there. And I really uh, learned a lot and, and got a significant uh, uh, amount of knowledge. But the uh, proliferation of the research and the industry involvement in this process created a whole different uh, 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 aspect of care called wound healing. And uh, I think that wound healing has kind of taken us onto a little sidebar because if you start looking at most of the wounds, they primarily are, are the leg and low extremity, and you probably have most of them are due to the chronic diseases that's been talked about here, if that makes sense. So um, uh, that, uh, that kind of pushes it to where, wh where we are, uh, are today. Uh, but two, two other things happened. In 2003, uh, Peter Sheehan led a... Uh, a program uh, was an a ADA, American Diabetes Consensus Development Conference in Boston uh, on a peripheral arterial disease. And so uh, that was a, a landmark uh, program and it was uh, published in 2004 in the uh, Diabetes Care. And then as uh, things evolved, uh, Dr. Mills uh, mentioned about the uh, consensus conference in um, that uh, the toe and flow and how um, the American Podiatric Medical Association, the SVS, uh, actually, actually got together Let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I came together, and out of that came, uh, there was a pu published issue. Okay. Thank you. A special issue of the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Uh, Dr. Anthony Sidawe and uh, Bruce Perler were, were editors of that, and that's a, a landmark issue uh, demonstrating the historical aspects and how uh, we really need to uh, work together. I believe that anybody that's treating uh, the diabetic foot and the chronic diseases should have that issue and make sure you go back and read and, and understand the connections with the historical aspects uh, in that regard. 
So I have a question. What does podiatry feel about vascular surgery? Any, any podiatrists here have any thoughts? I know we're going to have a panel discussion. Well, if you think about that slide I showed you, I mean, you, you can't live without me. I can't live without you. If, if indeed every complication is related to, to blood flow. And if we go back uh, quickly, I, I'll, I'll say this. This is the, the metabolic no part. It's really the polyol pathway, of advanced glycation endpoints, protein kinase C, and hexosamine, and then you have PARP, and then the mitochondria, and the leptin, and the free fatty acids. But it all leads to the dysfunction at the cellular level, which leads to inflammation, and it basically affects the vasculature. So every complication from diabetes is related to blood flow. And it starts with the polyol pathway, where you get uh, increased oxidative stress related to the NADPH when I need my slide to show, show you all of that, but it's definitely happening. But the most important part is the, is the slide on the protein kinase C. And that's where nitric oxide is downregulated and everything else is upregulated as deleterious in the cell. And they, all those things have significant vascular uh, complications. And so I think at the cellular level in this historical aspect uh, when we do that. And I think I'm all pretty much out of my time. Let's see here. Finally, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, summarize here. And this is how I look at that foot today. These are all the things that are actually interacting, and that's why we need a team approach, everybody working together. There's significant data to demonstrate the team approach in that, in that, in that process, if that, uh, that, that makes sense. And so the future would be the limb preservation team, the toll flow, and everything today is population health, workforce, and interprofessional education. And so I think the future, of, uh, as I mentioned earlier at the outset, we need residency uh, and fellowship training programs in the academic health centers to create a culture of cultivation and transformation. So once we can train those individuals, they can go and be the people that will be the worker bees in, in the communities where uh, the uh, process is needed. So uh, I think I'm over my time. Am I? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Wait, 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 wait one minute. Give me one minute. <laughs> I, I have to apologize to you all. I'm, I'm right-handed, but I've never had a thing that it was op opposite. So uh, that shows you that man responds to order. He doesn't want me to say anything else. That's fine. <laughs> I hope I've given you a, a small journey on the historical aspect. I can't wait for the, the panel and the discussions that will, uh, will follow. Because as long as George is here and he's moderating, I, I, and, and and uh, Dr. Mills, it would be, uh, would be excellent. But, I, but the only slide I didn't show was the academic affiliations. And so what, what you all started with that consensus development conference now, I think there are probably about 10 or 12 uh, podiatrists and in institutions now that probably have fellows. If they don't have fellows, they're working toward that, you know, et cetera. And uh, my final closing comment is that the, uh, that's what fuels my energy for the future uh, is to work on that in two states, in Texas and California, to keep moving that needle forward. There are 14 medical schools in Texas, and we're probably in about five of them pretty doing well, but the others need to do that, and that's all political, and Dr. Bogey taught me how to do the political thing, and I have uh, experience and credibility. And so um, uh, with that, uh, I want the Institute of Medicine to study us as a profession, to tell us who we are, and once that happens, then we have to worry about the decision makers up in the CEOs and the CMO because uh, uh, we're not on their radar screen. So to get on the radar screen, we need, need a study uh, to do that. And so I'm, I'm working in those arenas to help do that, and that will definitely trickle down to the private practices and working together. And the cost, quality, and value thing is the most important. All the big healthcare systems value us. VA is the single largest healthcare system. Tons of podiatry. They don't have one or two. They'll have 200, 300, 500, whatever they need to take care of the population in the health piece. Geisinger, Intermountain Health Plan, Kaiser. I get mad at Kaiser because they, I can't get any of them to go into academics. They all want to go to Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you.